Good afternoon, everybody. It's time to talk about my favorite topic in workers' compensation in New York, and that is Section 32s. Um, now, I know you've all saying, wait a second, Greg, uh, last month we did fraud, and you said that was your favorite topic. Yeah, these are all my favorite topics. Fraud, IMEs, you know, uh, Section 32s. Isn't this what life's really all about, right? That's what we're here for. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Section 32s. I'm going to talk about them, you know, sort of practically speaking, and what we're doing now to, to get 32s, um, how we handle cases with releases and resignations, particularly in light of the new uh, regulations or sort of the board uh, guidance that has come down, and then I'm going to give you um, my best practices for how to get effective Section 32s. All right, so you're sitting there and you're saying, Greg, what are these Section 32 things that you're talking about? Oh, wait, and before I go on, let me just say this. This is completely live uh, question and answer. So please ask me questions. This is our second session. Um, I see we have a lot of people on the line this morning. I got great questions, and um, you know it made it more fun. So as I'm going through, please ask me any questions you have, and then I'm happy to answer them at the end. I will only say your first name. I'll never embarrass you by saying your first and last names. I, I did say your name, so you know I'm answering your question. I will read your whole question so everybody has the um, opportunity to hear it, and then I'll do my best to answer it. All right. So our topic, Section 32s. Uh, what is a Section 32? Well, it's a full and final lump sum dismissal of all or part of a case. Uh, it's going to close whatever aspect of the case that you identify in the Section 32 settlement agreement with complete finality. And that's a very important thing in New York workers' compensation because when you think you're settling or resolving a case for a permanent residual disability, whether that be a scheduled loss of use or a loss of wage earning capacity, are you really closing the case with finality? Well, there is under section 123 an 18-year reopener period for any workers' compensation matter. So even cases where you haven't taken them all the way to permanency, just remember that claimant uh, can reopen that matter, bring it back before the workers' compensation court and seek more money or more lost time, or they can seek more medical treatment for up to 18 years. So that's why Section 32s are so awesome. And these are relatively recent innovation in New York. Uh, we have one of the oldest workers' compensation statutes in the country. Uh, it was uh, first uh, passed in 1911, but it wasn't until 1996, only 26 years ago, that we could do a lump sum dismissal. And now you can. So that's how we close these cases out. Uh, Section 32s are also useful because they help my insured clients avoid having to make aggregate trust fund deposits uh, because they are immune from that deposit. Also interesting about Section 32s in New York is you can reserve and preserve your rights to reimbursement and subrogation under Section 29 even in a lump sum dismissal. So you can do a lump sum dismissal in the workers' compensation uh, case but reserve your right to reimbursement under Section 29 from the proceeds of any third-party settlement that the claimant gets against any actual tortfeasor. So that's pretty cool. All right, what gets deducted from the lump sum settlement that we're going to pay to the claimant is only a couple things. The first thing is any child support lien uh, gets deducted, and that's actually a good thing. Uh, the second thing that can get deducted are the uh, any disability law claims. Because remember, New York has got multiple different kinds of leaves and paid time off and sick leave, and they also have a disability benefits law. So those disability benefit leaves claims are deducted. And the last thing that impacts um, a Section 32 settlement is a Medicare obligation under the Secondary Payer Act. So those are the things that would reduce or take away from a Section 32 award, meaning the money flowing to the claimant, right? The new money moving. So why am I so excited about Section 32s? What do I love about them? Well, of course, it's that flexibility. In a Section 32, I can settle part of the case. I can settle just one body part. I can resolve just one issue. I can settle just one period of disputed lost time. I can settle the whole case. I'm really flexible about what I can do in a Section 32. Um, the second thing is it's full and final. I mean, it, usually we're doing uh, Section 32s for the entirety of the case. We also say that if there are other claims pending in the Workers' Compensation Board, 
you should probably resolve them all at once in a global section 32. Um, you can utilize section 32 at any time in the case. So, you know, if there are issues that crop up that you want to resolve out by way of section 30, you can absolutely do that. You do not have to wait until the end of the case. And you can um, do a section 32 at any time. Now, it's interesting because the workers' compensation law does have all sorts of limitations on when you can get, for example, a independent medical examination uh, for the purposes of, de of determining permanent residual disability, right? Under the medical treatment guidelines and the disability duration guidelines, there are different times given uh, for the claimant to reach MMI and before which you really shouldn't uh, waste your time, effort, money, blood, and treasure on getting independent medical examinations. But that's not true with Section 32. You could do them at any time, including when the claimant is actively treating. The other good thing about a Section 32 is the judges don't really interfere with them. You know, the joke in New York is uh, I could Section 32 a ham sandwich. In the old days, the claimant used to have to come to court. And frankly, as long as the claimant was voluntarily accepting the Section 32, the judge was going to approve it. And that's different than other states. For example, I practice in New Jersey. In New Jersey, I can bring a lump sum dismissal to the court under Section 20 of that statute. And it's up to the judges uh, sort of feeling that day, you know, did they get their sleep? Are they excited to be there? Did the Yankees win last night to whether or not they're going to approve that Section 20? But in New York, the law actually says, Section 32B says that every Section 32 shall be approved unless there's something defective about the Section 32, which means the judges are supposed to be approving these things. They're supposed to be uh, uh, signing the orders and, and closing these cases with finality. In fact, the statute itself says that this is the preferred way of closing cases in New York. Now, the statute says the judge shall approve these. It doesn't say may or can or should. It says shall, and that's the strongest command that a statute can direct to an officer of the court. So it says they shall be approved unless there is some kind of unfair, unconscionable, improper um, aspect to the Section 32. And I'll talk in a couple slides about what you can't Section 32 or what is improper or unconscionable. Um, uh, the other time the judge cannot approve it or should not approve it or the Section 32 can be set aside is where there is some misrepresentation as to a material fact, whether that's a concealment on the part of the employer and carrier or a concealment or misrepresentation on the part of the claimant as well. The last rule regarding Section 32s and them being disapproved is where the parties decide 10 days after that Section 32 approval hearing, within 10 days I should say, uh, that one of the parties does not want to enter into the Section 32. There is a 10-day, you can get out and just uh, no, no harm, no foul, um, by simply sending a letter to the board and saying, I want to get out of the Section 32. But in general, the vast majority of Section 32s, and in my experience, 21 years doing this, over 99% of them are generally approved by the Workers' Compensation Board. Now, what's not allowed in a Section 32? What is, per se, as a matter of law, illegal or unconscionable? The first thing is an advance waiver. And I had a great question on this early this morning. I had a client who said to me, hey, Greg, why can't I do a Section 32 that says, hey, if you ever injured this body part again, you can't bring another one? And the answer is, well, because that's an advance waiver, right? So we can't do an advance waiver or um, have the claimant conditionally give up some other right benefit or opportunity in the future based on what we're doing in today's lump sum dismissal section 32 agreement. The second thing is we can't uh, have any discriminatory practices in a section 32, nor can we resolve a discriminatory practice in a section 32. Also, of course, your the discriminatory practices are not covered by workers' compensation insurance, so carriers should not be entering those anyway. Anything that clearly violates the workers' compensation law or is against the workers' compensation law uh, should not be put into a Section 32. So that's what the statute says can't go into a Section 32. Case law says there's some other things we need to be thoughtful of. We cannot resolve any kinds of claims or actions that are pending in other jurisdictions. Remember that the Workers' Compensation Board, this is not a uh, Article II or constitutional court. This is a court of limited power that's formed by an administrative agency, the Department of Labor. And this court cannot resolve issues in other forms or jurisdictions. I've had clients try to approach me and say, hey, can we resolve this on a global basis? You know, we have this civil action that's pending against us and a workers' comp action. Can I just put a little more money in the workers' compensation case to get that civil action resolved? 
And the answer is no, absolutely not. We can't do it. Uh, you could put in the documents and the silly hearted judge of compensation might actually approve it. But the board of compensation, they have absolutely no jurisdiction over any other types of claims in any other courts or any other forums. And so you just shouldn't do it. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, the second thing is waiving any claims, particularly those for discriminatory practices under Section 120. Uh, those are, according to case law, not the proper um, um, uh, subject of a Section 32 se settlement. All right, so what do we need to know about uh, submitting and obtaining a Section 32? Now, every Section 32 must be approved by a law judge. There is no such thing as an out-of-court settlement in New York workers' compensation law since 2003. Now, before 2003, from 1996 until 2002 and a half, roughly, the Workers' Compensation Board was allowing the parties to resolve cases by way of Section 32 out of court without a judge approving it, without it going before the court, without the parties coming before the court. Uh, there is a appellate level decision that came out in 2003. It said, no, 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 that, you can't do that. You have to have the claimant um, testify about how voluntary this is, et cetera. It needs to be approved by a workers' compensation law judge. So every single Section 32 needs to be submitted to the board for approval and then goes before a workers' compensation law judge. Now, the second part of that is the board now allows uh, the parties to submit um, a Section 32 uh, and have it be approved by the board but not have anybody present. So it's essentially a bench approval. That's great. I love that because it's a little quicker. You don't have to wait for a hearing. The problem is the board doesn't give the same um, size of a attorney's fee to the claimant's attorney when they uh, are just approving the awards from the bench. And so claimant's attorneys will not agree uh, to an on the paper settlement or put through. Uh, and that stinks because it does slow things down. And really the only person who benefits is claimant's attorney who's going to get their fee. But, okay, so what do you need to know about submitting Section 32 paperwork to the Workers' Compensation Board? Well, ever since 2021, we now have to, this is new, this is the new thing, you need to disclose any agreements or contracts that have been entered into uh, that are not part of the Section 32 but are surrounding it. And so really what is that talking about? Well, the focus appears to be on general waivers that we're asking, so general releases, and of course, resignations. Um, if there is an agreement or contract outside the Section 32, the board says, hey, we want to know about that. You've got to alert it to us. And now the board, of course, because they like to create new forms, has a new form called the Section uh, C-32-AF form. Why not? Um, and that is the attorney's affidavit indicating that there either is or is not some kind of outside agreement or other resolution that's been reached between the parties. And the reason the board wanted to do this is to address complaints, primarily coming from plaintiff's attorneys, that the claimants were being asked as a condition or as part of the Section 32 to resign their employment and take some kind of uh, payout and or sign a general release saying, I'm never going to see you in any other forum anywhere else. And I think the claimants attorneys were sort of complaining about that and the board listened and said, okay, well, we're just going to find out about that and we're going to uh, make the parties reveal that in our uh, Section 32 paperwork. Now, it's interesting because the board has no authority to oversee uh, or regulate resignations or general releases because, of course, those general releases would be concerning claims or potential claims in other courts, other forums, other jurisdictions, literally not before the Workers' Compensation Court. And I've already told you that the Workers' Compensation Court has absolutely no jurisdiction over claims that uh, arise any, uh, in any other form, any other jurisdiction outside of the workers' compensation law. So how can they do this? And the answer is they really can't, uh, but they did issue some guidance and now uh, everybody's sort of towing the line and revealing the presence of these outside arrangements and also executing and completing these C-32-AF uh, documents. But does the board truly have the authority to look into, regulate, consider, or care about any of this stuff? Well, the answer to that is no. All right, so let's talk a little bit about general releases. When we do a Section 32, it's very common for a client to ask me to also obtain a general release. And generally, we're looking at a very general release. It's literally releasing everything else in the world. Um, you know, any other claim that could ever be brought against them in any form. And we've seen, I, you know, I craft some of these for clients. Sometimes general counsel will craft them for clients. We'll do our best uh, to uh, get the ones that you know, are tailored to our clients' needs. These are not invalid just because the board is asking about them. Uh, 
They are not forbidden or prohibited. You can still do general releases and we still do them every single day. That's not a problem, it's not a challenge. Um, and this is, again, the general releases are where the person's releasing claims like that might be under the Americans with Disability Act or the Warren Act or some, uh, you know, Fair Labor and Standards Acts or wage and hour laws. Any of those things can be released. And of course, it's got nothing to do with the workers' compensation case. Again, the board is looking into this. They're, 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 uh, they're calling it significant scrutiny because they want to make sure that the Section 32 is really reflective of the actual agreement between the parties and that there aren't these side agreements or side money moving that the board doesn't know about. Next, another common thing for us to do at the time of a lump sum settlement is to obtain a resignation from the claimant. Thanks for playing, but your journey with us has come to an end. You no longer work here. Is that allowed? Yes, it's absolutely still allowed. They're not invalid. Any of the resignations you've already obtained, those are absolutely valid. Um, these are not prohibited or forbidden under the workers' compensation law. The only thing I want to just continue to warn people about is the resignation cannot be conditioned on the Section 32, and the Section 32 cannot be conditioned on the resignation. We really have to think of these as separate ideas or separate agreements with the claimant, and the one cannot be contingent upon the other. Now, in practice, what does that mean? It means that we want to be very careful about stating that these are not contingent on each other. We want it to be very clear to all parties that, hey, you could still have the Section 32 without the resignation, or you can do the resignation without the Section 32, certainly. Uh, but we want to make sure that this is very clear, and we're never pressuring the claimant to do the resignation in order to obtain a Section 32. And how do we do that? Well, the answer is typically there will be some consideration moving for the resignation. Look, I run a law firm, 100 employees. Uh, we do severance packages. That's a very natural, normal thing. That's really the same thing that we're doing here. I don't think there's many businesses that don't have some type of severance planning or severance package when somebody is separated from the employment. So can there be consideration for the resignation? Absolutely. How much? Well, it ranges. I've got clients who will say, Greg, I want the resignation. Here's 100 bucks. I've got clients that say, Greg, we pay for the resignation. I, here's a month of severance pay. So there is a huge range in there and it really depends on the client and their priorities. Best practices though on releases and resignations is, well, I always want to make sure that my releases are up to date, that we're using um, the most modern language we can, uh, and we always want them to reflect how voluntary this release is and truly not contingent upon the workers' compensation settlement. It's possible to add separate con uh, consideration. What is consideration? Money for the release, right? So that you can do that. And that would, I think, help um, if any reviewing party or reviewing court was to say, wait, is this release really uh, legitimate? Is it, or, or was it really contingent on the Section 32? And if you could point to it and go, yeah, but we paid them separate consideration for that release, I think that goes a long way in demonstrating that release. Now, uh, is, is uh, bona fide. Now, how do you do this? You gotta add language to your Section 32 agreement that just simply says, I mean, it's one sentence. Yes, the parties have entered into a separate agreement that has nothing to do with the Section 32. It's a release, it's a general release of other claims. That's it, right? And then of course, the attorney has to complete the C-32AF affidavit form indicating, yes, there is a different agreement out there somewhere and you don't need to know about it. Okay, resignations. We're constantly doing these. I think these are very important to help protect employers. If you're a self-insured employer, you should really be considering the use of a resignation at the time of a Section 32. It's really time for you to probably part ways from that claimant, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, in regards to insured risk or carriers, should you be doing this? Yeah, probably not, right? Uh, this exceeds the scope and bounds of your workers' compensation insurance policy, that contract that you have with the insured. This isn't really something that you should be either paying for, uh, pursuing, or pushing in any way. Um, in our experience, self-insureds, we're doing a lot of these separations early and we're doing it before the settlement. If it happens at the time of the settlement, that's fine as well. You know, that's something we're pushing. Again, these need to be voluntary on the, on the part of the claimant and they should be supported with some kind of separate consideration. I've got some clients who say there, are, there is no separate consideration. I've got some clients, again, who will go as high as to do a month of pay. Um, I think that if a reviewing court ever looked at a resignation and was saying, hey, is this 
uh, legitimately, uh, you know, something that was bargained between the parties and consented to, and it was truly voluntary. You'd say, yeah, look, here's a month's worth of pay that this person received for this resignation. I think a review in court would look at that very favorably and say that's absolutely bona fide. And it doesn't have to be that much. It could be one week of pay, maybe two weeks of pay. Any of that stuff I think would be deemed reasonable by a review in court. Of course, we have to reveal that we're doing the resignation in the Section 32. And once again, there must be an attorney affidavit filed. So are we still doing this? Yes, absolutely. All the time. Really, these are standard uh, of our of care. I think these are, you know, uh, what should be done. Um, if you've got questions about this, let's go. I'm, I'm going to dive in here now. We've got a lot of attendees. I'm hoping there's some great questions waiting over for me. Uh, Samith says, we have WebEx on New York. Not certain what you mean by that. That's if that's a question or not. Um, and I guess I'm presuming you're saying uh, we're doing all of our settlements via WebEx, right? Because that's the system that the board's using. Mandatorily, we have virtual hearings in New York. Um, all right. Maybe Samith wants to clarify that a little bit. Um, scrolling down here. I don't see any other questions, guys. I mean, I know I'm jazzed about this topic. I know it's a fun topic and it's something that we all care about. I know when I wake up in the morning and I put on my lawyer uniform and I get my lawyer haircut, I'm thinking about getting section 32s and getting cases resolved. I suspect you are as well. All right, um, let's close this up then. I can I guess we can button it up if there's not any other questions. I'll open up the panel one more time. Oh, good, Elizabeth says, hey, Greg, what's the turnaround time for section 32 approval? Well, unfortunately, it's pretty long, um, you know, 45 days to 60 days, not uncommon. Um, the courts will allow add-on days for Section 32s, uh, but unfortunately, right now, I am trying to settle all the cases I can right now and maybe through the first week in November to get people their money in time for Christmas. So that should give you an idea. I, it's unfortunately a very long lead time uh, of getting the board to actually approve these and to line them up. Um, and so, you know, if you're thinking about, hey, it's the end of the year, what a great time to make your Section 32 offers, right? You get to add those offers out in the next couple of weeks because otherwise, and get those cases resolved because otherwise you're not going to get on the calendar right now by the end of the year. So great question. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, all right, guys, thanks for coming. Uh, this was great. Again, one of my favorite topics. If you have questions and I didn't answer them or you think of the question later, uh, you know, feel free to email me and I will or call me and I'll, I'll email you right back. All right, everybody. Have a great day.